In, in the first presentation, I tried to outline uh, the emergence of Vietnamese ness, starting from the ancient mythological period, thousands of years BC, coming down to 939 AD, um, and the successful revolt of the Vietnamese against Chinese rule and the expulsion of the, of the Chinese power of the Sung Dynasty um, from Vietnam. Now, today's lecture, and we don't have enough time because in the, in the Li and the Trung and the early Lay period, there are hundreds of stories and poems and incidents and some of the most important uh, stories, like for America, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, I mean, all the great stories which shape your emotions uh, about a country and about a people, most of them occur in, in this space of about uh, 400 and some years. And we don't have time to go into them all. And quite frankly, I don't remember them all. So there's a lot. But I do want to give you some and some flavor for, for this. But I want to focus on a theme. And the theme is that this period of time, the Li Dynasty, the Trung Dynasty, and the first like 30 years of the Lei Dynasty really defined the Vietnamese nation as, as a unique nation. And it was that definition which has held true until the present time. And it was that definition which, it, which we can then use to explain all the other things that happened in Vietnamese history and particularly uh, the struggle against the communists. Because my argument will be when we get to modern times is that communism and the Communist Party is against, is, is antithetical to this sense of being Vietnamese, which emerged under the Li, the Trung, and the first really uh, ruler of the Lei dynasty. And then in the next session, we'll talk about how this, this, this powerful sort of national identity begins to crack and weaken, and how as it cracks and it weakens, uh, political struggles, rivalries break out, French colonialism comes in, and there's a struggle between the communists and the nationalists. And the simple theme here is Buddhism, sort of as the glue of, of Vietnamese identity. That's overstating the case, but Buddhism as a theme on one side, and Chinese Neo-Confucianism on the other, which I'll talk about a little bit today, but more next week. Chinese Neo-Confucianism is going to come into Vietnam after this period. And it is going to be one of the forces that breaks up the kind of power and unity and high morale of the Vietnamese people by creating different kinds of values and different kinds of political patterns and family dynamics. Now, there are three themes I'd like to concentrate on today around the Vietnamese national identity. One of the points I think we can make is that the Vietnamese uh, different from most other peoples in Asia, established in effect a nation state very early, 1000, 1200, the Li dynasty. The only other people who clearly did this were the Japanese. The Koreans, I don't know that much about, might be a third case. The Chinese have something of a different case uh, because they have a grand philosophy which becomes Neo-Confucianism and a sense of heaven. But the Vietnamese have a nation state idea that the Europeans came to in the 1600s and the 1900s. Something like being French or being German or being American. The Vietnamese had this a long time ago, as we'll see, and it legitimated them and empowered them in this period to fight back against the Chinese a number of times. Uh, and the, another people, sort of similar to the Vietnamese in this sense, are the Jews because the Jews had some sense of a separate state going back thousands and thousands of years. One of the parallels between the Japanese, the Vietnamese, and the Jews is a sense of special destiny. Now, for those of us who are raised in the Christian tradition, the Jewish sense of special destiny goes back to the Old Testament with the promise of God to Abraham, that if Abraham and all his descendants served God, he would give them the state and he would protect them. In the Japanese sense, there was also a sense of special destiny, which is that the Japanese emperor was descended from the sun goddess, Amoretsu, and the Japanese people were all descended from powerful kami, 
that the great powers of the universe had created the Japanese on the island of Japan as a very special people in a very special place, second to none. Now the Vietnamese, as we'll see here, but we set it up last time really, a special sense of destiny also resting on geomancy, not subservience to anybody else. And some of the great statements that I will read and the justifications and these famous quotes from Vietnamese generals and kings, I think you will see consistently go back to this sense of mountains and rivers and a special destiny. Now, a nation state is defined in the West after the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 is the concept of a piece of territory with a ruler who has an administrative legal system over everybody who lives in the territory. So critical to a nation state is a legal structure. It's an independent set of laws, which the French have, the English have, the Americans have, the Germans have, all modern nations. One of the requirements uh, to be a modern nation is you have to have your own law code, your own laws, which you enforce with your own police over your own territory. And other people can't come in and enforce their laws. And you don't go over there to impose your laws on them. Now, as we will see, the Lee Dynasty, the Trung Dynasty, and the Lei Dynasty had national law codes for, Viet for the Vietnamese people for Vietnam, for a state. They had the name of a state, they had a territory, they had law codes, and they had an administrative hierarchy. They had an army. They had all the things that modern nation states have very, very early. By the way, at 10, when the, or 1010, when the Lee Dynasty comes into power, uh, Europe is a feudal, is a feudal mess of conflicting uh, barons and dukes and kings and, and uh, city uh, communes and uh, bishops and monasteries. Remember, William the Conqueror conquers England in 1066. So the origin of sort of the current English state happens but while we're talking about the Lee Dynasty. Uh, so that's the historical parallel in the West. And at this time, there are no real nation states. It's feudalism. It's the king and his barons in Capite uh, in head, in chief, the barons who held directly of the king, and then the barons had people underneath them, and it, the power flowed back and forth between different kings, different barons, um, and you didn't have the national identities of England, Scotland, and Wales, for example, or France. You don't get France until really, what, the late uh, 1600s under Louis XIV kind of thing. So that's the first point. There's a nation-state concept. The second theme is what distinguishes Vietnamese ness? In this period of the Li, the Trung, and the Lei, we will see the, the, all the elements of vietnamese understood, expressed, written, poems, history, stories. It all comes together, and it's rich, and there's a lot to it. Uh, the first point about vietnamese nest that we talked about before, and you'll see, is destiny. Vietnamese have a tremendous sense of destiny, uh, and particularly destiny as it applies to individuals and to the group. The second thing we saw before is that central to Vietnamese-ness is this concept of phúc đức, merit virtue, quasi-Buddhist, uh, quasi-Buddhist, also quasi uh, some sort of traditional uh, notion of just inner power, inner control, inner goodness. Um, and phúc đức applies to the individual. So one of the remarkable things about the Vietnamese, which has been ignored even by a lot of Vietnamese in recent decades, is the Vietnamese are fundamentally individualistic. So the concept of freedom makes a great deal of sense to Vietnamese. It's not in the, in the old language, but, you'll see, but if, if you had time to read all this stuff, you could just see these patterns and stories of Vietnamese. They don't like to be bossed around. No Vietnamese likes to be bossed around by anybody else. It's true in the Li Dynasty. It's true in St. Paul today. Um, and therefore, when the communists come along and they want to boss everybody, there's a sort of instinctive Vietnamese reaction that says, no, I mean, go away. You know, I don't like this. So the communists, we'll get to this at the end of the lectures, the communists, in order to gain power over Vietnamese, have to draw on the emotional sense of nationalism and community. Otherwise, no one's going to follow them. Now, the second thing they do, and we have a real example at the start of the Trung Dynasty, uh, the communists, they kill people. You get out of line, and um, you'll... you'll lose a lot. Now, the one thing that the Lee and Trung did, I think, in Vietnamese-ness is they began to balance some of the tension that I talked about last time. 
in the tradition, there is a tension between men and women. There's a tension between the patriarchal father side, which is more Chinese, and the matriarchal mother side, which is more Southeast Asian. There's just a tension in there. The Chinese go all the way over to the patriarchal side. Some other societies go all over, like the Lao more, go over to the matriarchal. The Vietnamese, under the Li and Trung, they get a balance. Uh, and where they find their balance, I want to suggest, is Buddhism. Buddhism becomes the main religion and very important for the Li and the Trung dynasties. We'll talk about that. Uh, and Buddhism, because it focuses on the individual. Neo-Confucianism focuses on the family and discipline and hierarchy. Buddhism is all about individuals. It's about, it's about your own soul, your own heart, your own state of mind, your own karma, your own seeking, you know, I cannot seek nirvana for you. Only you can get nirvana for you. Buddhism is a very individualistic thing. Combined, however, with this notion of Phup Duk, there's a sort of flow down from your mother and other people in the past. But still, the Phup Duk comes down to you. Um, but interestingly enough, if we assume the two of you are sisters, same mother, you will have a different fate than your sister. You could have a brilliant fate, she could have a terrible fate. Same mother. How do we explain that? Buddhism explains it very simply, and yin-yang thinking explains it very simply. You were born in year of the horse, she was born in year of the cat. And you were born in a particular sign in the year of the horse, which is a lot of trouble. Horses have to carry a lot of weight, right? You were also born in the sign, you're a lame horse. And she's a, she's a great cat. And so Vietnamese say, yeah, same mother, same tradition, but different consequences, individualism. Um, now, under the Trung Dynasty, we have a conscious effort. I'll try to, there's so much to talk about, I may forget about things, so I apologize in advance. In the Trung Dynasty, there's a conscious effort to talk about the Tam Yao, the three religions. They didn't pick and choose. There are actually four, however. They didn't pick and choose between Confucianism or Buddhism or Taoism. Taoism is nothing we haven't talked about yet, but it, it, it comes from China. But it, it probably has, it came from South China. So it probably came out of the ancient Viet peoples anyway. And Taoism is all about flow. Taoism is all about flow and balance. And so you had Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism as the three religions which were interrelated. People could respect all of them at the same time, one of them, but each was balanced by the other. You didn't have to pick and choose. The regime supported Buddhism, they had Confucian temples, and they did Taoist uh, things as well. Tam Yao. The fourth one, however, uh, which is neither Buddhism, Confucianism, nor classical Taoism, is this combination of spirits and yin and yang. Maybe we could even say there are five. A, a, a fourth religion would be belief in spirits, uh, tongue. Uh, ten, sainted, sainted beings, sainted spirits, who are either the spirits of mountains or trees or turtles, or powerful people who when they die, they, they have so much cosmic energy in them. They have such a great force that their spirits survive and come back. And, they, and in, after that, down to the present, I don't know the history on this, but there are many powerful cults of uh, uh, mediums who are mostly women, dumb coat, uh, where you go into trances and you go up and you, you go into the celestial heavens and you become another being and you communicate with these great beings, these great spirit beings. Um, my half-sister-in-law is a very, very well-known, uh, very practiced domkot and medium in Hanoi and she has been particularly with the cult of Chang Hung Dao, who we're going to talk about, the great, the great warrior leader. Um, and then the, the fifth one is what we talked about before, yin and yang, face reading, geomancy, um, and, and uh, the, your, your horoscope, which year, month you were born. Um, so all these things come together for the Vietnamese and they all circle around this notion of individual fate. Um, now I'm gonna talk about a guy in the second hour, uh, Nguyen Trai, uh, who was a great minister uh, under the Lei Dynasty, or the first king of the Lei Dynasty. And I wanna focus on him a lot because he adds a kind of structure to this blend and he writes about it in many, many writings, and he gives it a, a, a presence. He articulates it, he makes it real for us, it comes alive. And he was a great poet, too. Um, so 
when we get, and it's after, frankly, after the time of this guy, Nguyen Tai, that things begin to shift and go in a different direction. After, there's a, there's a transitional lay king, a great king, maybe one of the greatest kings in Vietnamese history, Lei Tantong, uh, 1459 to about 1498. Uh, we'll talk about him next time. He's a transition figure because he's beginning to bring things in from China. And my argument is he begins to tip the balance away from this Vietnamese-ness towards bringing a different kind of thing in from China, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. After him, the Vietnamese elite goes more and more and more and more in this Chinese neo-Confucian direction, which doesn't focus on the individual and is not about balance. It's about hierarchy, it's about structure, it's about duty. And neo-Confucianism gives power to the family over the individual, to the father over the mother. It emphasizes class, well-educated families as opposed to ordinary families or poor families or uneducated families or plebeian families or families who don't have uh, classical training in Buddhism or Confucianism and they go worship spirits of the, uh, the mountains or the trees or something like that and their women go do these strange cults and stuff. Um, and it's that Vietnam which has trouble. And it, it starts, you see it in the mid 1500s and it sort of continues to the present time. Now, uh, one story, however, about spirits, well, it's in my mind, uh, to give you a sense of the reality of this, two stories, actually, from 1970, uh, one from 72, one from 75. Uh, then I want to talk about Chinese neo-Confucianism as the other thing, very briefly. The first story in 72 is there was a big North Vietnamese invasion. American troops had basically left South Vietnam and the North Vietnamese threw their entire army into an invasion and one, th one third came down to a place called An Lop, uh, northwest of Saigon, another third came in the middle of the country attacking Khan Tum, and another third started way up on the border with North Vietnam, well actually, sorry about this, um, one, one massive invasion comes here. Another, they've been in Laos, illegally using Laos and Cambodia all these years. They come into Kantum here, and the third prong drives down here to An Lot. There are some North Vietnamese units here and some remaining Viet Cong units in Binh Dinh, uh, right about here, and they rise up to support the invasions. The province chief in Binh Dinh, well, first of all, because the invasions are so strong, all the regular Arvin forces, the big, the big battalions and the divisions have to be moved out to counter these, uh, particularly here. They've got to go up into the highlands, into the mountains to counter the North Vietnamese offensive, leaving local troops only to fight the communists in Binh Dinh. And the province chief, Colonel Chuk, I think his name was, um, I heard the story from a couple of people. He um, wanted help and guidance as to how to defeat the communists. So he went to one of these mediums and he went into a trance, and he went up and he, he met with the spirit of Trung Hung Dao, who defeated the Mongols, as we'll see in the 1200s. And Trung Hung Dao tells him how to defeat the communists and gives him a sword. And so afterwards, as his province chief, Colonel Chuk, in his green fatigue, his three uh, you know, bars, his colonel bars on his shoulder, he's going around organizing the defense against the communists. He's got some guy right next to him. With a, with a satin pillow, purple or red, I can't remember, on which is a wooden, old Chinese sort of sword, wooden. And nobody says anything. But all the people in Binh Dinh, they all, they look at the guy and they look at the sword, and Trung Hung Dao gave him that sword. So what do you think happens? All the people rally to him and they beat the communists. <laughs> it's just, you know, and, and you get American military advisors saying, oh my God, these Vietnamese are nuts. I mean, you're going to go out and fight, you got some guy with a, with a wooden sword and a pillow? I mean, you know, that's not, we don't teach that in West Point. You know, what kind of crazy people are these Vietnamese? Well, the problem is all these Vietnamese, they see the sword, they think of Trung Hung Dao, they say, he's on our side, these are we go get him. If you didn't have the sword, if it was just you, the province chief, going out there saying, stand up, go get yourself killed against those guys because I'm your boss, what do you think would happen? Vietnamese would say, yeah, boss, you go fight him. Um, so then the next story about sort of geomancy and politics and things like this is in, in 75. Um, there's the final, the, the North Vietnamese invade again. President Thieu gives an order to retreat 
from here and here to set up the new boundaries of South Vietnam down here. And so the commander here gives orders for all over the several divisions here to come out, I think by this road here, because uh, the North Vietnamese are surrounding them, and then he gets in a helicopter and flies out. And it's, a to it's total chaos and disaster. And the North Vietnamese come in and they surround, they capture all the Vietnamese main forces. And uh, President Thieu, uh, two, 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 where is it? Phan Rang. President Thieu, his home, t his home village is somewhere down in here near Phan Rang, Tri Thuy. Uh, and President Thieu was a great believer in fate, in geomancy and fortune telling and face reading. Now, the previous story on this is back in like 1958. Um, his career is not advancing. He's not being promoted up in the army. And he consults a fortune teller to ask why. What, what can I do to change my fate? My foot duck for my mother is there it is. My birth date, there it is. You know, what can I do? And the fortune teller, for whatever reason, says you have to relocate the grave of your grandfather. It's very powerful stuff. Uh, because if your grandfather's grave is in the wrong place, you're going to get a bad flow of cosmic energy down through the family line. If your grandfather's grave is in the right place, right on top of a wit, where there's lot, lots of yin and lots of yang, and hopefully a big wit and a good wit, uh, if it's right there, then all that good stuff flows down in the family line, and you get to be president of the republic. So what does President Hugh do? He moves uh, his grandfather's grave. And guess what? He gets to be president of the republic. So in 1975, <laughs> Uh, an Arvin, I think it's a battalion of rangers who are really pissed at Tew for basically losing the war and having this retreat. Instead of going out to the coast to get on a boat to go down here, they take a detour. They go into Tree Tui village, they dig up his grandfather's grave, they take out the bones, and they smash the bones. What this means is no descendant of Wing Van Tew will ever amount to anything. It's 1975. And the other question, the other aspect of this story is, and this is true, it also was, is in Newsweek. Um, some major general has to go into Tew in his presidential office and deliver the bad news. So the scene must have been something like uh, this. Uh, excuse me, Mr. President. I have a news from, from Two Corps. Yes, yes, yes. Tell me what. I'm very busy here. Sir, it's, it's, it's in, uh, from uh, Fan Rang. Well, what, what about Fenner? I mean, I've got General Fu on the line. I've got to do this. Well, sir, it's uh, mm, a Tree Tree Village. What? Uh, sir, I, um, uh, uh, the grave um, uh, destroyed. Tio faints. Faints. Collapses on the floor. Faints. He gives up. Cannot become president. And there's nobody to really run South Vietnam for two or three remaining weeks. Because Tio really believed in this stuff. Um, and it goes back to the Lee and the trunk in the early lay. This is very, all very Vietnamese. Now, let me um, start with the, well, first of all, let me talk a little bit about Neo-Confucianism um, as an offset to what I'm going to talk about about the Vietnamese. Now, the Vietnamese got their independence from the Chinese after the collapse of the Tang Dynasty. Now, the Tang Dynasty in China was very influenced by Buddhism. Confucianism was not so strong. After the Tang Dynasty, a new dynasty comes along, which is known as the Sung Dynasty. Tang is like this. After the Tang, we have the Sung. And under the Sung, a new social philosophy, political philosophy is developed. And it is called, by the Western scholars, Neo-Confucianism. In Vietnamese, it's called Tom Nho. Tom is the Vietnamese pronunciation of Sung. Nho means Confucianism. So Tom Nho, or Neo-Confucianism, is different from older Confucianism. And the difference is completely overlooked by almost everybody in the West and most contemporary scholars. Neo-Confucianism is a combination of Confucius's thinking about hierarchy, uh, a Buddhist Taoist philosophy that says Confucius thinking comes from the, re the mind of heaven, so you can't change it. 
and it blends in the imperial requirement of obedience and order. And the key concept of Neo-Confucianism is filial piety. In Vietnamese, uh, this is Yao. In Chinese, it's Xiao. Filial piety, which is the subordination, it's the subordination of, of wives to husbands, the subordination of children to parents, and the subordination of citizens to the prince. And a good person is an obedient, docile, subordinate person. Your ethics and your virtue are measured by the degree of your obedience. And this goes back to a Chinese sense that the most important thing is order, order in the state. And this is not Vietnamese. Order in the state is not a high priority for Vietnamese. And obedience is not, I would say, a high priority for Vietnamese. So as more and more, and this is what's going to happen later, as filial piety comes in, tension is sort of being generated within, Vietnam, within the Vietnamese family, individual, uh, and culture. Uh, and there's more to uh, Sung Neo Confucianism, but we'll talk about that in future, future lectures. Now, the Li, to use this board, in 939, this guy, Ngo Quyang, without the marks, um, establishes independence. Then there's sort of an interregnum, and there was this guy, Lei Wan. And, but he could not establish a dynasty. He has a young son who's overthrown, and some Buddhist monks, note, Buddhist monks advance a man whose name is Li Kam Un, and he becomes the first king of the Li dynasty. And the Li dynasty lasts until 1228, under a number of kings. Now, what's interesting is um, another part of this Vietnamese-ness is how are they going to relate to the Chinese? This man takes the name of his state. This is important, too. He calls the state of Vietnam Dai Viet, the Great Viet. The Chinese do not accept this. He calls himself Dai Viet Wang Dai. A Wang Dei is an emperor who can talk to heaven. Dai Viet Wang Dei. The Chinese call him, however, the Yao Chi uh, Guan Vuong, the prince of the district of Yao Chi, which is like saying you're a, you're a district you're you're a district administrator. There's no way you're you're an emperor of my equal. Um, and then a few years later, they they call him uh, Nam Bin Vuong, the pacified South King, the king of the pacified South or the king of the peaceful South. Notice. In the Chinese title, there's no recognition of the concept of Vietnamese. There's no recognition of Vietnamese as a special um, people or entity or having their own claims on things. Um, now, one of the, well, there's a story about uh, Lee Kam Un uh, that he had no father. And his mother apparently went to a temple. And, and a spirit came into the temple at night. And she came out of the temple pregnant with Lee Kam Un. So this guy's got something special about this guy. The spirits, right, have come in to mark him out as opposed to somebody else. At the age of three, his mother gives him up. And he's raised in a, in a Buddhist monastery by the monk uh, uh, Van Han who later on becomes the head monk of Vietnam and promotes him up within the, uh, uh, the, the people around the, the king and in the palace. Uh, now, after he becomes king, one of the famous stories is the founding of Hanoi. Because at this point, Hanoi is not the capital. This is the guy who makes Hanoi the capital. And the story, roughly speaking, is He's on a boat going down the Red River, and he sees a golden dragon rise up from a lake in a water and ascend up to heaven. So you now have the presence and the power of a dragon, a water being, a water spirit here. So he says, this is where we put the capital, in Hanoi, because, it, because geomancy. 
There's the, the, the dragon is a symbol of, of the forces of yin and yang, and it's got spirits, and it's a great water lord. So he moves the capital to, uh, to Hanoi. And he becomes, because of his patron, he's a promoter of Buddhism. He builds pagodas all over this part of Vietnam. He makes great big bronze bells, which is something that patrons of Buddhism did. You make a bell and you give it to a temple. Um, and um, he dies after a few years. It's a very short reign. But I, wanted, I want now to read you some early poems in this period. Now, before Van Han, there was a previous monk whose name was Kung Viet. And uh, he writes this poem called Wood and Fire. Deep inside wood sleeps primal fire. Set free, it kindles back to life. If there's no fire locked up in wood, where does a tinder spark come from? Now, notice wood and fire, these are some of the five elements of yin-yang thinking. So what this Buddhist monk is saying is that in wood there's fire. Otherwise, if we light a match, how come the wood burns? Something has to be in there, even if we can't see it. Um, uh, Van Han, the patron of this first man. A flash, the body is, then no more. All plants in springtime thrive, in autumn fade. Let fortunes wheel, let, let fortune roll. Dread not its rise and fall. A dewdrop poised atop a leaf of grass. All things come and go, we're born, we die. This is the springtime today, out there is springtime. Fall, all the, all the flowers will be gone, snow will come, ice will take over, and then all the ice will go and the snow will go and the flowers will come back and the leaves will come back. Let the wheel turn, the wheel of the Dharma, the Buddhist wheel, the wheel of fate. Dread not its rise and fall, the up and down, that's your fate. All you are is a dewdrop poised atop a leaf of grass. You're nothing in this great cosmic scheme. Then, one of the interesting things is Lee Kum Yuan dies. And um, after no, no Quien, another guy, I uh, talked about Din Bo Lin and Lei Wang, when the father dies, the father had had all this personal power and energy, this, this special fate. He dies, the sons don't have it. Nobody follows the sons. This way of ruling is called charisma. It's a charismatic kind of democratic system. What it means is if you have charisma, people follow you. If you don't have charisma, people don't follow you. Um, he dies, and he's got a number of sons. He has appointed his first son uh, to be the successor. But three brothers do not accept this. Three brothers gang up, bring all their troops together to attack the palace in Hanoi and assassinate their oldest brother and then fight among themselves to be king. But in a, in a change, there's a, a, a loyal guard whose name is Lei Fumhiu, and he confronts the other troops, the troops of the brothers, and he basically says, look, our late lord is not even dead two days or something like that. His spirit is still with us, and he appointed this son, and where is your sense of honor and respect to his spirit that you're creating chaos um, and, and not, you're not being loyal to him because of who he was. And all the troops agree with him, they back off. Uh, the, the designated heir becomes the second king, Li Taitong, and, the younger, and he pardons his younger brothers for making rebellion. Then what he does, and this is done in the Li and the Trung dynasties, and it's abandoned when the Vietnamese go towards Neo-Confucianism. There's an annual oath. The, uh, all, all the generals and all the great Manuans once a year have to go to a temple and they have to swear a blood oath um, to, to the king that, um, uh, if I can find the page, I may not be able to find the page in here, um, that, that they will be loyal. Now notice two things, please. One, an oath is an act for each individual. Each individual person has to say to the king in front of the spirits, 
I am loyal to you. I am loyal to heaven. I am loyal to you. I am loyal to the virtues. I'm a good person. I'm only binding myself. I'm not binding anybody else. And secondly, it has to be done every year. So there's a certain concern here. You know, our president only has to take an oath once at the start of a four-year term. This system, all the lords and the generals and all the relatives, they had to do it every year. They had to go to the temple. And the temples usually were, one was the uh, temple to the uh, Dumco mountain. For some reason, there's the spirit of Dumco, which was selected as a particularly propitious spirit. So you went there. Um, and by a blood oath, that's what it means. It was some blood, uh, chicken blood or beef blood or something like that. And you had to take the oath and drink it. Uh, and also part of, for in most cultures, uh, part of the oath tradition is that if you break your oath, the spirit is going to get you. So you may assassinate me as, as your lord, so I can't punish you, but don't worry. You took an oath to the spirit, the spirit's going to come out and the spirits will get you. And also the way people think, uh, maybe not just you, but your grandson or somebody. I mean, you, you'll pay a price because the spirit's going to come back after you. Um, the other thing that starts to happen is that the Cham Kingdom, there's some Cham people who live all along here, and wars begin between the Choms here and the Vietnamese here, which don't end until about 1500, when the Vietnamese finally conquer Champa by about 1500. So Li Tai To begins to in attack the Choms, and he has several very successful uh, engagements, invasions. Li Tai To, the number two guy, comes up with, um, Li Tai Tom, sorry, uh, the first law code. He has, he has a law code in the Mindao year. He calls the year Mindao or Nguyen Way, and he has a law code. So he's creating the structure of a state, and he organizes the army, he organizes bureaucracy, he has a ways of uh, collecting taxes. Also, ver a very famous uh, monument in Hanoi is a little pagoda standing on top of a single column. It's called the Chua Motgot, the pagoda of one column. And the original one, this is a copy, was built by this king, Li Tai Tum, uh, in about 1040, after he had a dream that the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara had appeared to him. And so in order to honor the Bodhisattva, he builds this little, this little pagoda, or this little shrine, actually, to worship the Bodhisattva, Quan uh, Am uh, in, uh, in Vietnamese, Quan Yin in Chinese, on this pagoda in Hanoi. And you can go see a replica. It's one of the most famous uh, tourist spots. Um, now, he has a son, Li Tan Tom. And one of the interesting things here, in 1072, is the king creates a, um, a shrine kind of place for Confucius and some of the uh, great patrons in the Confucian tradition the Duke of Zhou, Mencius, and now there's beginning to come into Vietnam this non-Buddhist thing from China, more officially, because the king is the patron of this. And they start to have some examinations. One of the key aspects of the Chinese state is you used written examinations in Confucian writings to select mandarins. Only men who have studied and have memorized all these texts and can sit down and write out in all the characters answers to the questions and not make a mistake in the Chinese character. Apparently in those exams, if you're writing a character and you have one little tiny mistake, you're writing uh, thousands of characters and the examiner sees one mistake in a stroke, you flunk. So this is a training period of, of great uh, concentration and focus and discipline on prior texts, not on thinking for yourself. Uh, but in 1076, the Vietnamese bring in the Quốc Tu Yam, the uh, sort of the library and the Han Lam Vieng, a, a, uh, uh, the institution for study. So they, they're a Buddhist. Remember, we have the pagoda, the one pillar pagoda for Avalokiteshvara. Now we have some, uh, some Confucian kinds of things coming in. Now, at this point, there's a, the Sung Dynasty is still ruling in China. But a very powerful prime minister comes up, whose name is Wang Anshou, and he um, wants the Sung and the Chinese to be powerful again. The Sung never had powerful armies, and so they always had border problems. So Wang Anshou organizes the taxes, raises more money, has bigger armies, and he wants to discipline these cheeky people who live here, these Vietnamese. 
So uh, the Li Dynasty attacked the Chinese up here, and then there's another invasion, and then there's a Chinese army that comes here, links up with the enemies to the Vietnamese, the Cham here, and invades this way. And there's a very famous general uh, who's a member of the royal family, whose name is Li Tung Kiet, and he beats the Chinese. So Ngo Quyen, 939, establishes independence. In 1075, the Chinese come in again, the Li Dynasty beats them. Uh, and um, one of the things about Li Tung Kiet, well, the story is, and this is really famous, and everybody for centuries has sort of memorized this, um, there's like the night before the battle, as I remember the story, there are like thousands of Chinese soldiers over there, and there are hundreds of Vietnamese soldiers right here. <laughs> Odds are not looking good. So apparently, so Li Tung Kiet organizes a ceremony in a Buddhist temple, and all the generals and leaders go into the temple to pray for victory and success, and he hides behind the big statue of the Buddha, and he shouts out the, these famous words, this poem, um, which in English uh, is, the southern emperor rules the southern land. Our destiny is writ in heaven's book. How dare you bandits trespass on our soil. You shall meet your undoing at our hands. These four lines, I gotta find them in Vietnamese around here somewhere. Um, these capture the essence of Vietnamese, and they've been quoted ever since. Um, uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the colonels I used to work with in pacification in Vietnam, his name was Li Tung Kiet. He was Trung something or other, Li Tung, his parents, his father, you know, remembering the great man, named the boy, you know, Li Tung Kiet after uh, this guy. But the southern emperor, they, Nam Dae, there's a Nam Dae, there's a, there's a Dae who can talk to heaven who's in the south, and he rules the southern land, the, the, terror, the mountains and the rivers of the south. Don't mess. And this destiny, this destiny, this cosmic destiny, which cannot be changed, is written in the book of heaven. Chinese are always talking about the heaven and, and what heaven does. So this Vietnamese guy is saying to his own soldiers, don't worry about those Chinese. Heaven's on our side. Not on their side. He's on our side. And then how dare you hear the bandit, Yak. Yak is, like, is worse than bandits. I mean, it's like, you know, really cheap, uh, thuggish bandits. Um, um, vagabonds, brigands, I mean, just no moral basis at all. How dare you yak, come to our soil, which is protected by heaven. Having done that, you're going to lose. There, there's, there's no way you're going to win. Let's see if I can find that uh, 279. Maybe I should get somebody who's really good to read this. This, by the way, is the, the formal history of, of Vietnam, written first under the Trung Dynasty and then revised under the Lay. And it's kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah. Who's, 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 who's good? Is your Vietnamese good? Okay. My aunt to my aunt. I can, I can. You can, you can recite it. You can get it recited, huh? Remember that poem. Nam Quốc Sơn Hà, Nam Đế Cư, Tiệt nhiên, Định Phận Tại Thiên Tư, Như Hà Nghịch Lỗ, Lai Sầm Phạm, Ngũ Đảng Bình Khan, Thắng Bại Ư, something like that. The last sentence I don't remember well. But exactly the, the English version reflect the, the really intent of um, Leighton here. That's, that's the famous thing uh, I remember doing uh, in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, there was, um, a book done in the 1930s. Uh, uh, in the 1930s, a lot of this reality about Vietnamese history began to come back because the French repressed it. The French government didn't want the Vietnamese to study their own history. And previous to that, the ruling dynasty, the Nguyen dynasty, we'll talk, didn't want the Vietnamese to remember the Li and the Trung because the Nguyen copied the Chinese. And um, 
So uh, one of my wife's uncles, Wang Sun Han, uh, in the 1930s began doing research and writing about sort of this history to bring it back to the Vietnamese. And in his book, he found the, the Bia, the, where Lee Tung Kiet is buried in the south in a temple. He's buried in a temple somewhere down in here. And they wrote, there's this Bia, car, Chinese characters carved in stone, about uh, uh, 1080 or something, describing him. And I'd like to read this to you. It's about Lee Tung Kiet, the guy who had this poem. As a man, he was, and listen for the themes I was talking about, about uh, virtue and individualism and charisma, and think, is, is this a guy you're willing to go out and die for? As a man, he was within, illuminated with enlightened intelligence and kindness, without, favored with simplicity and grace. He did not spare any pains in the effort to improve public morals. In public affairs, he was thrifty. In using the people, he sought to obtain their willing acquiescence. He didn't boss everybody around. He just said, Can you, would you help me build this road? Would you do this? Would you do that? Because of this, the people could rely on him. They trusted him. They could rely on him. He was lenient and saved many people. He was humane and loved the people. Because of this, the people revered him. He had what I mentioned last time, this Vietnamese concept of we didn't. If you have wheat then, you get things done because people want to work with you. They want to help you out. If you don't have wheat then, it's a little harder. He took stately might to eradicate criminal gangs and righteousness to settle court cases. Because of this, there was no abuse. He knew that having enough to eat was the desire of the people and planting rice fields was the foundation of the state so that he looked to the timely completion of agricultural tasks and no loss of agricultural opportunities. He administered with skill, so there was no need to fight and suppress disorder. He provided for the aged in the remote sections so that old age was peaceful. Such was his way. It can be called the taproot of political rule, the magic art of bringing peace to the people. And basically, I would submit to you that that's the formula for good rule in Vietnam from then until the present day. You're that kind of a person, you do like that, and, and you know, people will follow you. Um, it's not quite that easy because one of the other things that happen is that people get jealous of you and they try to make your life miserable uh, before you get a chance to get some power. Um, so by the time the Sung Dynasty invades again, there's a state, there's laws, there's leadership, there's a philosophy of rule, and they're individuals like Lee Tung Kiet who embody these Vietnamese values and they mobilize the people and they beat the Chinese. Now about this time, however, the Chinese give a new name to the Vietnamese. Um, they then call the, the state, I'll do it over here, I guess, uh, just do it here. They call it, they call the Vietnamese king, they put him up a couple of notches. They call it An, oops, An Nam Quoc Vuong. This is where the, the, the phrase Annam or Annam, which was Vietnamese were known as the Annamese by the French or by a lot of people for a long time. Annam means uh, peaceful south. And it comes from the, the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty called, uh, the, their ruler of Vietnam was the Annam Do Ho Phu. But Annam is peaceful south. Notice again, no use of the concept of Viet. No reference by the Chinese that the Vietnamese had sort of national identity or autonomy. And quoc uh, means nation or state, that's uh, guo in, in Chinese. Uh, and vuong is underneath a day. I didn't talk about that. Vuong means is king. Day is, is like, a vuong does not have the right to talk to heaven. A vuong has to go through a day in order to talk to heaven. Uh, and now, uh, the Li Dynasty lasts for about another hundred years, but it's getting weaker and weaker. Um, and rebellions are breaking out. 1208, there's a big rebellion. And, and the Cham are starting to attack. And the kings do not have sons. And the, 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 the wives of the kings and their families, the, again, the, the matriarchal impulses are coming out again. The queens and their families are taking over control. Uh, and they're fighting with each other. This queen's family against another queen's family. 
and young boys, three or four years old, are, are become king, but they're puppets in the hands of their mothers or their, or their, their uncles on their, their mother's side. Um, now, there's a family down here of fishermen. Uh, underneath, the, there's a, 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 a clan, that they call the Trung clan. And the, the first leader of the Trung is apparently, he's a pretty tough guy. Um, and he's a fisherman and he organizes, he's, and he becomes very wealthy, and he has many followers. Um, and in one of the, the um, chaotic events in the Lee Palace, the crown prince flees from Hanoi and takes refuge down with these Trung people. And would you believe it? There's a beautiful Trung daughter. So the guy falls in love, marries the Trung daughter. All right, now we got a woman here, right? You, can, you all can see which way, which way things are going to shake out, right? So he then becomes the next king, Li Wei Tum, and uh, his wife is a Trung. And part of the deal in the marriage deal is that the Trung family will support the Li. So he becomes king, his wife is a Trung, you've now got all these Trung men and, and their armed retainers to fight off against the Cham. Um, now, the problem is, one of the problems is that the Trung queen uh, gets into trouble with her mother-in-law. Right, the mother of the king, yeah, right? This is very Vietnamese. Okay, we can talk about this for a long time, right? Mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law in Vietnam, but it's the husbands, in America, basically, it's the husband with the wife's mother, right? That's traditionally our sort of issues. Vietnam, it's the, it's, it's the husband's mother with the, with the wife. And these things can get quite intense, actually. Uh, and here we are back in, 11, in, in, in 1224, and we got a problem with the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law, which affects the destiny of Vietnam. Um, now what happens is Wei Tong gives up, okay? All the stuff's going around him, and he, he's a weak guy to begin with, and he drink, and he be, basically becomes kind of uh, drunken. And a relative of the daughter-in-law, the Trung, Trung Tuk Han, has all the power within the palace. Uh, then um, one of, okay, so Wei Tong dies, and, the, and oh, he, has no, he has no sons. They're just daughters. So he makes one of, one of his daughters the crown princess. Her mother is a trung, right? Wei Tong goes away. I think he retires, uh, but he's still alive. She becomes the queen. Um, and uh, one of the, the trung queens, her, her mother, her mother, with one of her mother's younger brothers, who's a really famous guy and sort of a bad guy, but sort of a good guy, Trung Tudo, huh? he makes a deal with his sister that they're going to push the Lee clan out and the Trung clan is going to take over and rule Vietnam. So what they do is they marry the Lee princess uh, to a Trung son. Um, and then the princess, she is, she is enthroned as the emperor. So the only times in Asia legitimately a woman has been placed on the throne. But she's only like seven years old or something like this. She's very young. Uh, and it, there's all this plot behind her. And um, after that, uh, where's the end of the Lee? Um, what happens is the, the queen realizes, um, Chu Wang, her name is Chu Wang, Queen Chu, um, that she is um, not capable. Um, and so she abdicates in favor of her husband. And the, th the throne passes to a Trung man. I don't have time to read all of this, but it says, uh, this is, this is her, her order, or, or her Sung uh, Chiu, her, her rescript, I think they say, but it's not a good English word. But um, from old times, the, 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 the nook, the other thing is, is the Vietnamese use this word nook, not quốc. Nook, the nook, uh, it, which means, w means water, but it also means the state, the nation. So again, we've got some association here in pure Vietnamese between something about geomancy, nook, and, and uh, the state, the place where we are in our rights. Nook Nam Viet Ta, our, our, our state of the southern Viets. Uh, we have had Dei Vuong, uh, we have had uh, Dei, the two words, the Vuong, who is also a Dei, uh, ruling us uh, for a long time. Uh, but the Li dynasty has, is getting weak. It doesn't have a strong people or intelligent people. Tai Duk Deo Tiu, 
our abilities and our virtues. I'm just reading from this text. This, this thing was written in 1224. You know. uh, our thai and our duk are, are missing. We could have said that about Wing Ventil in 1975. You know, you know tuk duk, tu thai. Get the guy out of there, you know. Um, come 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 uh, no one to help us. Zak Kup, Noi Len, you and you um bandits and 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 robbers are all over the place flocking around like bees. Uh, so what are we gonna do? Well we fortunately we have the young man Chung Kan, uh, who is uh Ngoi Vang Chak Du Vea, Tuk Te Kat Kwang Tu Hien Yang. He's, he's as famous as the founder of the, the, the Han Dynasty, Han Kao To, uh, the founder of the, the Tang Dynasty, Duong Tai Tom, not, not over above him. So why not make him king? So therefore, I'm stepping down and letting my husband step up and start the Trung Dynasty. Um, now, let me um, read a few things from the Li history, and then we'll stop and um, take a break, because I think these are sort of interesting. Um, in the history, in the year 1012, there is the first of a number of, of records that the Li king uh, went to see boat races. Now, how many of you are aware that the annual dragon boat races that the Asian community has been doing here for a couple of years? Here's in the Vietnamese history. In 1012, Vietnamese had dragon boat races. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, they're recorded six or eight times. Um, then, uh, oh, this is, I thought this is good. Um, yeah, he went to, he went to uh, uh, Ying Zhao, and there's lots of trouble with thunder and lightning and earthquakes. And the king, this is the first king of the Li Dynasty, goes to a temple, and, and, he, lights, and he lights the incense. Uh, and, and, and he, to, to heaven, and he says, I am a person with a little bit of duk, virtue. Tôi là người ít duk. I am on top of the people. Um, I, I, uh, can, I don't dare to use my, my power, bin we, uh, to, uh, to get rid of all the bad guys. Uh, but because the... Uh, um, the people of Dieng Zhao don't follow the right customs, and this, it's, these bad things are happening. And so I'm praying that my own virtue uh, can, um, can help them out. And um, if there's any wrong, please blame it on me, not them. And uh, I say this with a sincere heart. Uh, pray, he finishes praying, and the thunder and the lightning go away, and everything is peaceful. Um, in uh, the, the second king, Lei Tai Tom, a uh, very famous story again, he casts a great big bell and he puts it out in front of the palace. And anybody, any Vietnamese can come and ring the bell. And the, if, if you have a case, if you have a dispute, if you've been oppressed, you come and you ring the bell. And the king himself will come out and hear your case and, and do justice. Uh, on, let's see, page 300. Uh, the, a famous king who's a, who's a good Buddhist dies and uh, they have to go find a place for his grave. Um, so what do they do? This is in the history. Uh, yeah. Sai yang nghi dai phu mao du do den phu thiên đức chong đắc tốt de say sung lang ku nhung tom chong đắc tốt to find the, the good land, uh, the right geomancy for the king's grave because that's going to help the entire Lee Lee Dynasty, right? You put the king's grave in the right place, the whole dynasty will be strong and good and no one will make trouble for them. If you pick a bad place, dynasty is not going to do too well. Uh, in 1144, one of the kings creates a, a, a den for, for spirits. In addition to Buddhism, in addition, to, uh, this, is before, this is after they've had the Confucian uh, uh, temple. Um, so I think those are some, some comments there. Uh, when we come back, I want to read you some poems from some Lee kings and some others, and then we'll go on through the Trung Dynasty. So, thank you very much.
Well, actually, I think I'll wait on because the Lee poems are not so good as the, some of the things from the Trung and Wing Tri, and that's more important to read. So I think I'll turn to, uh, to the Trung dynasty, uh, which uh, has a number of really important um, aspects and features to it. Um, uh, Trung Tudo is this tough guy. He's the uncle of this young king. And he does a number of things. These are sort of stories about how he gets his, his dynasty up and running. Uh, and not all of them are very nice. Uh, the first thing he does is after a couple of years, well, he goes by the, the old Li King, uh, who's the father-in-law of the young Trung King now. He's retired. He's still alive. So Trung Tudo walks by him and, and just says out loud that uh, old things that are no longer uh, needed really should disappear. Something like that. So Wei Tom says, uh, the old king says, I've heard your words, I understand your meaning, and he commits suicide. Then, uh, a year or so later, as all the men of the Li clan gather for the annual ancestor worship to their Li ancestors, uh, the former Li kings, Trung Tudo secretly has this temple, this Li temple surrounded, and he goes in and he kills them all. So there are no Li men to be contenders to organize a rebellion against the Trung family. One. Two, an order goes out that all people who have the Li family name have to take the Nguyeng family name, which is why the Nguyeng family name is so big in Vietnam, because it's not only real Nguyengs, it's also former Li who are Nguyengs. And then after, I don't know how many hundreds of years, a number of Li resume, they've been able to trace, they remember that they really are Li. They, they bring back the Li name. So you will find some Vietnamese these days who have a family name of Li, but not too many. In a fascinating thing, and I, I have a newspaper article on this somewhere, a Li prince escapes uh, the, the, um, the murders. He escapes this, and he flees, and he ends up in Korea. And he marries into a Korean royal family. And there is a Korean Li family to the present day, uh, which is descended from a Vietnamese Li prince. And 10, 15 years ago or something like that, one of these Korean Li went back to Vietnam. And they've kept their genealogy. I mean, this is like going back to 12, 1228, 1230. And you got to Korea. And I think, well, was the, uh, the Korean guy? We used to know Korean Chinese guy? What was his name? Oh, John Lee. John Lee. Didn't he say he was descended from that? Yeah, yeah John Lee was here. He used to work for 3M here in Minnesota. He writes his name L-E-E, -E, the Korean way. He claimed he was a descendant of the Vietnamese Lee who, who came into Korea. Um, another little comment is sort of the Lee family. Uh, people with the surname Lee is the only family to have produced rulers of Vietnam, China, Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. All of those countries that won the Sung dynasty was a Li family. Uh, there have been various, there's a Li dynasty in Korea. The current uh, f uh, prime minister of Singapore is Li Sheng Lung, right? Uh, the other, the pr president of Taiwan a couple of years ago was a Li family. So I had an older friend of mine who said, see, there's got to be something about the Lees that, you know, in all these different countries. But I think it's just an accident and circumstance. Okay, uh, Trung Tudo. Um, he, his, the, the, the king uh, is really annoyed at him, uh, and so he leaves Hanoi and flees. And there's a fight within the family, and, no, and he flees. And he goes up to a monastery on Inktu Mountain and says, I want to be a monk. I don't want to be king. So Trung Tudo goes up after him up to the mountain and says, what are you doing here? And he says, well, uncle, I don't want to be king. I want to be a monk in a mountain. He says, you can't do that. You're the king. And he says, the next thing is, wherever the king is, that's where the court is. So we're going to bring the court up here into the monastery on Ingto Mountain. <laughs> and the young man realizes that it won't be much of a monastery and, and the Buddhist retreat won't work. So he agrees to go back down to Hanoi and uh, do what his uncle tells him to do. Uh, the next thing is this, the, his wife, the Lee Princess. For 12 years, she cannot conceive. There are no children. At the same time, the, uh, a brother of the king has a wife who is pregnant four, six months pregnant. So Trung Tu Do arranges two divorces. The Lee 
queen, princess, is gone. She's divorced, and he takes the pregnant wife of a brother and marries her to the other brother so that there will be an heir, presumably a male heir, who's trung. And, and but the, he's not, nobody's happy about this. Neither brother is very happy, but Trung Tudo gets an heir who's, uh, who's from the Trung family. Now, a couple of years ago, this, this murder, this murder of all the Lee, is pretty unusual in Vietnamese history. Not a lot of similar examples uh, of a program to just kill a whole, a whole clan so that you can have power. It's not very good Buddhism. It doesn't give you a lot of phuc tuk, um, but Trung Tudo did it. Now, there was a second incident, something similar. There was rivalries over the centuries, but there was a similar kind of thing in 1946, late 45 and 1946, where the communists went out of their way in Vietnam to round up all the other leaders of the different Vietnamese groups and kill them. And it was several thousands of people. Uh, including some really important ones, as I mentioned last time. The founder of the Dai Viet Party, Dai Viet Quoc Dang, the founder of the Dai Viet Zuizang. Uh, later on, it's Win Fu Sho, the Wa Hao, and there are lots of other people. And one of the big, and that's what started the civil war among the Vietnamese, those murders in 46. And one of the big issues is always been, why? Well, wh why did the communists do it? What's the, because it's like, where did this come from? The Vietnamese generally don't, generally Vietnamese don't kill each other. They just sort of separate. If you don't like somebody, you just basically you back off. You don't go kill them. So why did they do this? Well, a couple of years ago, I was sent over the internet a supposed uh, last will and testament of Ho Chi Minh, written in hand, which is probably a forgery. Uh, but it was going around. But I was interested that, and, and because in this will and testament, he apologizes. He apologizes to the Vietnamese people for his life because he has caused so much murder and suffering, and he never brought happiness to the people. Uh, and he then says that it was a mistake uh, in 1946 to have followed the example of Trung Tu Do. So I'm just wondering if there, even in the minds of the communists, there wasn't this sort of justification that the, you know, the Lee were weak, you had to get rid of them, the, the country needed strong leadership, 1946, you know, these other Vietnamese, they're all weak, none of them are any good, we gotta fight the French, so it's okay to go kill all these people. But Trung Tu Do did that. Another thing Trung Tu Do did, he was a believer in geomancy. And he was afraid that there would be places in Vietnam, there would be Huyets, where young men would be born in the future who could rise up and overthrow the Trung Dynasty. So he hired all the great geomancers, the best geomancers in Vietnam, and sent them all over the country to find these points, these Huyet, and destroy them somehow. Uh, and there's a, a comment in here somewhere about how it didn't work because, because Le Loi and Ho Kui Li, these guys who ended the Trung Dynasty, they still got born, they still came up, and the Trung Dynasty still collapsed. Now, there are two, um, several important things um, about the Trung Dynasty. One is they beat the Mongols. The other is the Trung kings uh, started a Buddhist sect called the Truklam sect. The most important thing probably is that they beat the Mongols three times. Now, no other people in the world beat the Mongols, not even once. So the Vietnamese did it three times, which is pretty remarkable. And they did it by mobilizing individual Vietnamese to go out and fight. There was no huge standing army. Under the Lee, the, 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 the bodyguard of the king was about 2,000 men. If you needed an army, you had to go ask for volunteers. The Trung had a family clan, but they had a small army. And if you're going to fight the Chinese, you need to mobilize 100,000 men. And how are you going to do it? They have to agree to follow you because you cannot command them. You cannot force them in. And um, the, uh, uh, so this is evidence, I think, that this Lee Trung, this Vietnamese state, had something that engaged the people. It was strong. It was solid. It had, it had self-confidence. It had a sense of purpose. It had pride. It had a sense of national identity and honor. And people were willing to, uh, to sacrifice for it. Um, on that point, um, 
I was just looking through, uh, flipping through some pages this morning, um, and uh, sort of one of these other stories, and there's so many about this, and I can't, uh, Trung Prince, uh, Trung Bin Trum, uh, was captured by the Mongols. Um, and the, uh, uh, he, he, he refused, to, he refused um, um, to cooperate. He refused to uh, peacefully surrender. Um, so that the, the enemy, the Yak, they asked about what's going on in Vietnam. Uh, he refused to reply. The Yak, they asked him, Do you want, how, would, how would you like to be the king of the north? <laughs> and uh, uh, Bin Drum said, uh, I, am, um, I uh, come from the, the, the Nuknam, the southern state, and I have come tam. I have no interest uh, in being the king of the, uh, north, of the north. So they killed him. <laughs> so here's a guy who says, I'm from the southern state. I have no interest in being king of the north. North is a big deal. China is a big deal. The guy says, I'd like to be king of China. He says, I don't give a damn about being king of China. Hey, cut his head off. I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of, a, sort of a gutsy, patriotic, you know, very Vietnamese kind of thing to do. And, and notice that the words in the history are Nam Bak, south and north, the same concept that's here. There's a sense of the south that deserves to be autonomous, that deserves to be um, itself. Um, the Trung also have um, a law code of their own. Now, the Sung Dynasty gets weak in China, um, and the Mongols under Genghis Khan become powerful in Mongolia, and Genghis' sons and the Mongol armies then spread in different directions. Kublai and others go south. It takes them a while, but ultimately they conquer all of China, and they come down to here. Other Mongols go west, and they conquer all of Central Asia. Uh, they get into, um, and the descendants, Tam, uh, Tamerlane, goes into Afghanistan, where the troubles are today. Go, they go down into India. They set up the Mongol dynasty. They capture Baghdad. They, they, they capture all the lands of the Arabs. Uh, they capture almost all of where Russia is. And they're going over to attack Vienna. And about, and about this time, about 1300, uh, all the knights of sort of um, Eastern Europe gather to protect Vienna against the Mongols, and they lose, right? But it's winter, so the armies withdraw and the Mongols go into their winter uh, camp, and the idea is ne in the next fighting season, the Mongols are gonna start at Vienna and probably end up in Paris, right? Conquering all of Europe. However, w during the winter, Genghis dies back in Karakorum, and Batu, who's the head, this army's called the Golden Horde, and Batu goes back to Karakorum and gets into a big argument with his uncles and brothers and cousins about how to divide up the empire. And by the time, years later, he gets back here, uh, the energy has gone out and Europe is saved. So the Europeans, you know, when they had to fight the Mongols, I think, um, they lost. So the Mongols demand the submission of the Vietnamese. The, one of the Trung kings, one, uh, first of all, Trung Tu Do refuses. He says, no way, I'm still alive. Secondly, another Trung king asks a fortune teller to Semboi, that's what it says here, Semboi, to look at the fortunes. And the fortune teller looks at the Semboi and says, you will have a great victory. Tainau Dai Tang. No matter what happens, a great victory. Um, and so the first thing is, a Mongol army comes in this way from Yunnan down here, and the Vietnamese stop them, about 1250 or so. Then there's peace for a while, and then, the, the Vietnamese build up their forces, the Chinese come, the Mongols come again. Now, to be fair to the Mongols and the Chinese, these armies were not first class Mongol armies. So the Vietnamese were not exactly fighting the hordes of Genghis Khan. They were fighting probably Mongol, Chinese conscript, groups from, conscript troops from here with, with Mongol officers and a few Mongol units. But nonetheless, a lot of soldiers, okay, a really lot of soldiers. And, the Mongols are invading with a huge army. They also link up again with the Choms down here. So there's a threat from the south coming up. They've got the Vietnamese heartland in a pincer movement. What to do? Very famous story. The Trung King calls a big council of all the generals, of all the princes, all the great members of the family and others in the Yinghom building. In the, so it's called the Council of Yinghom. And this is really famous. 
And he says, what do we do? He's the king. He's the boss. But he's not. He says, what do we do? Again, individualism, process, dynamic, uh, and the decision is made to fight. So they fight. And they win. And then later on, there's another Mongol invasion, because the Mongols are not happy with this. So the Mongols come back another time. And there's a story where the, the same king, uh, Chung Yung Tom, uh, he, wants to, he wants to give up. Because they're going to kill everybody. The Mongols are going to kill everybody. He's, he's convinced of that. So he goes to his, his, the, the general, his cousin, uh, this uh, Chung Kuk Tung, who's also uh, Chung Hung Dao, uh, gets named Hung Dao Vung, uh, who's a military leader, and says, um, you know, if we keep fighting and we lose, It'll, it'll be, it'll be um, will be the cause of a lot of death and sadness, and why should we do this? And the general, Hung Dao, says to his relative, the king, says, that's very humane. That's, that's a humanitarian position. But what about the satak? Satak is the phrase for the altars of the grain and the spirits. What about the spirits, the altars of our ancestors, of the Vietnamese, of, of our being special and independent? And Hung Dao says that if you're going to surrender, um, you have to cut my head off first. And here's my head. He goes down like this. So the king says, OK. So then they go out, and they beat the Mongols the third time. And the big battle, the famous one, this is very famous, is, is the battle on the river of Bat Dang, Bat Dang River. Uh, and there's actually been a previous use of the Bat Dang River, which is, which is one of these branches of the Red River along here somewhere um, under the Li when they were fighting the Chinese. Anyway, this is a, a river, as I understand it, with a great tidal flow, because of the tides from out here go in and out. So there's a great rise and fall in, in, the, in, in the water level of the river. When it's high tide, it's a very high river. And then all of a sudden, the tide reverses and rushes out, and the water drops three or four feet, something like that. So what, what the Vietnamese do at one low tide is they get great stakes of, of trees, and they make sharp points at them, and they put them in the mud in the, in the bottom of the river, along the bottom of it, and they point them at an angle going, facing upstream. They got all these, thousands of these stakes in there. And then they send some, some of their army down with some boats here, uh, sort of as a decoy, to lure the Mongols on. So the Mongols see them, and then the Vietnamese get all excited and pretend they're afraid. And they turn around and they rush up river, up river. And they've got the thing timed so that by the time they get up there and all the Mongol fleet is way up river, the tide reverses. And the Mongol fleet is sucked back by the rushing tide going out, back into these posts, which smash the hulls of the Mongol boats so they all start to sink. The Vietnamese are on the side, and they just kill all the Mongols. Uh, and in the museum in Hanoi, you can see a big old piece of wood, which looks like it's been in water for a long, long time, that the museum says is one of the real posts uh, from the Bat Dang River in, in, this, in 12, 1282 or something. Uh, could be. I mean, I'm sort of skeptical, but you, know, you never know. I mean, if the wood if it had been buried in mud for centuries, it would not have, would not have decomposed. Um, so, uh, quite, quite possibly. Um, then the, uh, one of the other interesting things about the Trung is the promotion of Buddhism. And, and this is related to something else. The Trung, unique in Asia, created a political device called the Tai Tung Wang. When, uh, when a king was still uh, very mature, maybe in his, his late 40s or early 50s, very vigorous, very mature, capable of rule, he would abdicate in favor of his son. But he would ret retreat to an inner palace or to a monastery and, be, and become the, 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 the Tai Tung Wang, the, the, the supreme emperor, which in Chinese way, you can't do it. You only have one Wang at a time. Um, so you had a system where there was an, an older person to give advice. If the Mongols invade, you had somebody who could come out and rally everybody. And you also had a younger man who was sort of being trained, was being groomed. To, uh, to take over. And this system worked through the entire dynasty. And some people feel uh, that, that it was a very effective device because it gave the top of the leadership sort of two people, one of whom was less involved in day-to-day -day administration so he could kind of cultivate his virtue 
And by the way, he's a Buddhist monk. He's in a monastery. He's doing poetry. He's, he's meditating. He's cultivating his virtue. And that virtue radiates out over and down the family and the dynasty. And then you have a younger man who can hear the court cases, organize the, uh, the soldiers, uh, talk to the uh, uh, civil, civilian officials, travel around the country, see what's going on, inspect the dikes, and, and things like that. So we have um, a number of Trung kings um, who uh, wrote very good poetry. Trung Tai Tom, before attaining wisdom. Before attaining wisdom, man is flesh. It's red, it's white. Can one disguise the truth? Clouds swept away, a hushed, infinite void. Along the edge, blue skies, blue mountains blend. And then Chung Yung Tom was the king about the time of the Mongols were coming in. In the midst of dust, that's a very Buddhist phrase of Bui Dai, the dust of life. We are here in the dust of life. In the midst of dust, enjoy the way, trust fate. Fate, again, this theme of fate. When hungry, you should eat. When wearied, sleep. There's treasure here at home. Why look outside? Face life with a lust-free heart, and you need not pray. It's kind of a Zen, uh, there's a, this Truklam sect that he started. Uh, it's a Zen-like sect where through meditation, you, you penetrate to the, the essence of Buddhahood. And you sense the essence of Buddhahood, and you bring that back into you. Um, King Chung Mintam, blue mountains roll and throng before the eye. West of the brook, sun rays glance off a roof. Beyond the woods, birds' cries can't lift the hush. Along a path, old pine trees drop some co uh, cones. Um, the, um, one of the founders of this, the son of this great general, Hung Dao, uh, became a monk. He was a good general, he became a monk. And one of the stories which gives a flavor about this, his sister invited him over to have dinner sometime, and there were some meat dishes on the table. And, uh, most Buddhist monks are, are vegetarian. They don't eat meat. So this guy, this monk, starts eating meat. And his sister says, what are you doing? You're a monk. You're a Buddhist. You know, you're eating meat. How can you do that? And his response was, the Buddha is the Buddha. I am me. Uh, you know, and if I eat meat or don't eat meat, the Buddha doesn't care. So it was like some sort of very practical statement about, about there's a difference between living in life and having a mind in a proper state. But that sense of, of practicality, the Buddha is the Buddha, I'm me. You know? I mean, let's not get these things confused, which a lot of people do. So a lot of monks tend to sort of confuse sort of who they are with years of abstinence and being a vegetarian as if they're sort of living on an elevated plane from the, uh, the rest of us. Now, um, the Trung Dynasty II, uh, in time, uh, becomes weak. And um, towards the end of the Trung Dynasty, uh, they begin to patronize a little more scholars who are trained in the Chinese classics. Um, and the Cham, there's a very powerful Cham ruler from here, Che Bong Nga, who invades a number of times. And the Trung are getting weak. And a family from Tanwa, which is down here, this is the heartland. From down here, this is a new sort of area. There's a river valley and becomes wealthy. Uh, there's a man there whose name is Ali, Lei Kui Li. And uh, he has two aunts who each become queen. So again, we've got a dynamic with, through the mother. And each of these sisters gives birth to one boy who becomes a, a Trung king, but they don't live very long. Um, and uh, the, the nephew, Ho Kui Li, who becomes Ho Kui Li, he gets promoted up, and he begins to take over power uh, from the Trung. And he uses uh, um, colleagues, associates, friends, uh, subordinates who are trained in Confucian thinking. And in 1400, he does away with the Trung dynasty. And he declares his own dynasty, the Ho dynasty. Because originally, he traced his family descent back to China. And um, the clan name was Ho. Now, he also called his country, or his, he called the country he was ruling, Dai Ngu. 
because this is the name of the state of Wei in China, where his ancestors came from. So he wants to become the king of people who, under the Lee and the Trung, have this great sense of being Vietnamese. They're Vietnamese. And there's no Viet in here. He's saying, I'm the boss. And what he's trying to talk about is a hierarchical order based on Chinese Confucian teachings and Neo-Confucianism. Um, what happens now is there's a new dynasty in China. There is the, the Ming Dynasty, very famous. They have driven out the Mongols, and they're now a very famous, very powerful Chinese dynasty. And the second king, when he hears that, there's, that the Trung are no longer uh, in power, there's been a usurpation and a new ruler, they invade. He sends a Chinese army to invade Vietnam to put the rightful claimant of the Trung family back on the throne. So Ho Kui Li uh, sends out the word to all the Vietnamese to get together and rise up and fight the Chinese. And guess what happens? Nobody comes. <laughs> Nobody comes. So Ho Kui Li is out of there, and the Ming Chinese are ruling, uh, ostensibly to put the Trung back on the throne. Well, what do the Chinese do? Well, they have a change of heart. They don't reestablish an independent Vietnam under the Trung family. They try to incorporate Vietnam into China. They try to make it administratively part of China, wiping out Vietnamese independence. There's no more Nam Dae. This is just an administrative part of China with Chinese administrators and the Chinese build schools, and they do all kinds of good things. Um, they build roads and stuff like that. But one of the things they do when they leave is they take all the books in the archives, the Vietnamese archives, and take them up into China and they've disappeared. Which is why we don't know what the Li Law Code looks like. We don't know what the Trung Dynasty Law Code looks like. We've lost a lot of books uh, thanks to the Ming Chinese. Now, um, the Vietnamese don't like this. And a famous, another famous story starts to happen. There's a student, a former student and associate of this guy Ho Kui Li, whose name is Nguyen Chai, and he's from an educated, wealthy family up here. And he hears of a guy who has got good character, who's very strong, who's a, who's a good leader, who's admirable, who you can, people will follow him. Uh, he's, he's wise, he's smart, and he's courageous. And his name is Lei Li, actually. We call him Lei Lai these days. There's a story. And he lives down here in Tenwa. So the story is that the, the, the high, sort of high class guy from the uh, Tonkin Red River Delta goes down here to find this guy who doesn't come from a big fancy family at all and meets him and talks to him and decides this guy can lead the revolt of the people against the, the Ming. So he, Nguyen Chai, says, I will support you if you rise up. So Le Loi rises up with Nguyen Chai as his advisor. And he gets a bunch of, of clansmen and others who are famous generals. And in 10 years, they basically push. And they have terrible episodes. They win battles. They lose battles. A couple of times, they're, they almost starve to death on Mount Lam, which is in here somewhere. Um, but what really happens is the second Ming emperor dies. And his successor doesn't really want a headache in Vietnam. So in, in 1428, the successor king in China says, OK, we give up. And they pull out. And Le Loi comes in and takes over as, and sets up the Lei dynasty with the help from Wing Tai. Um, the little story, because this goes the way old thinking, his real name was Le Li. But Li is the, is the, is the, word, for, uh, for, it's the word for prophet uh, in Chinese. But there, there was a convention in ancient China and ancient Vietnam that no one can speak the, the word or the name of a king or a queen or crown princes. But, but Li, Lai, is, is, a, Li is a very common word. You use it all the time. Lai Bao Niu, how much money did you make? All this kind of stuff. So no, as soon as he became emperor, no one could, use the, could speak the word Li or even write the character Chinese way. So what the Vietnamese did is they changed the pronunciation to Lai. Um, so they had, they had Lai, and, uh, and they wrote a little bit differently. So in history, he becomes known not as Lei Li, but as Lei Lai. Uh, and the Vietnamese word for prophet is now Lai rather than Li, um, which is also a fascinating thing here to me about Vietnamese history is that starting in, in the um, 
Lei Dynasty and documents, if you look at the Chinese text, you can date the document to the way the characters are written because there were certain rules that as long as certain people were alive, you, you had to change the strokes in the character. The character for moon or night or beauty or jade. I mean, if you're the queen and, you're, and one of your names are jade, we can't write the ordinary character jade. We have to add a stroke or drop a, drop a stroke, but only while you're alive. So if we see a document with the character jade written with an added or dropped stroke, we can guess that document was written when you were alive, which dates it to certain periods of time. Um, so we can look at a lot of things that way as to the influence of particular people. Leiloi with Wing Chai um, set up a system and a couple of things. One I need to read to you, there's a famous poem called the Bingo Dai Kao, uh, which is the, the great poem written by Wing Chai on the defeat of the Ming. But perhaps more important, uh, and this is, this is the uh, English translation of the Lei Dynasty Law Code of about 1433, uh, done by some colleagues of mine at the Harvard Law School the other year, and dated by Professor Wee through this advice, the device of looking at these various characters. And Wing Tri probably did not have a hand in this, but it was his colleagues. And so we have, and very quickly, the, the significance of this is, this is a Vietnamese law code which took nothing from China. The Vietnamese have just been ruled for about 20 years by the Ming Chinese, and the Ming Chinese had one of the most sophisticated law codes of any country, any people, anywhere. The Ming code was copied by the Koreans, it was copied by the Japanese, it was followed by the Qing Dynasty, it was used by Vietnam in the 19th century. It was this incredibly sophisticated, thorough code, and Le Loi and Wing Chai had nothing to do with it. One of the key differences is in this code, for example, women can inherit. Daughters can inherit. In China, they could never inherit. And there are a whole number of things in here which are very Vietnamese, uh, and they do not exist in Chinese law, which is evidence that at the beginning of the Lei Dynasty, the Vietnamese state had a law code and its own conceptions based on its own values, its own sense of identity as to how to run a state and how to be a people. Now, the uh, Bingo Dai Kao, uh, a couple of things. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Dai Kao. In the, uh, in the Confucian tradition in the Book of History, there are various things called announcements, Kao, which are related to the great sage kings and the ancient kings of Chinese history. Wing Tri writes this for Lei Loi as if Lei Loi is of equal dignity to those people because it's the same kind of thing. It's a big announcement. And it's also called the Bin Ngo. Ngo is the Vietnamese pronunciation of the Chinese character Wu. Wu is the state around Shanghai. That was where the Ming Dynasty were ruling in Nanjing. So he, they don't talk about defeating you know, the Ming or anything. It's, it's the Wu, the Wu people. And this is for Lei Loi. I have indeed heard that acts of humanity and justice aim essentially at attaining peace for the people, and that military strength established for the protection of the people has no more urgent function than to eliminate violence. Our state of Daiviek is indeed a country wherein culture and institutions have flourished. Our mountains and rivers have their characteristic features, but our habits and customs are not the same in the south as they are in the north. Because we're not Chinese. We're Daiviek, we have our own mountains and rivers, we have our own customs. Since the formation of our, of our Nuk uh, by the Chu, Din, Li, and Trung, our rulers have governed their empire exactly in the manner in which the Han, Tang, Sung, and Yuan did theirs. Although we have been at times strong and at times weak, we have at no time lacked heroes. Uh, and then he mentions a number of uh, sort of Chinese heroes. It says, and then uh, some Vietnamese heroes, too. Um, recently, the Ho, Ho Kui Li, by their troublesome and cruel administration, aroused anger in the hearts of the people. The mad Ming, stealthily awaiting every opportunity, took advantage of the situation to pour poison into our population at the same time that a group of scoundrels who longed for treason prepared to sell out our country. This is the Ming. 
They burnt living, this is kind of like the U.S. Declaration of Independence, all the bad things that George III did. They burnt living beings on cruel flames. They cast young men into pits of suffering. They cheated heaven, deceived the people. Their perverse tricks assumed thousands of various shapes. They suborned the troops, stirred up hatred. Their combined oppressions lasted for almost 20 years. They violated the principles of righteousness. That's a, that's a Confucian principle. Injured that of charity. Nyungia, these are the things that, that uh, I'm going to talk about for a second. They're, um, to the extent that heaven and earth seem to have drawn to an end. The taxes were so heavy, the contributions so burdensome, that neither mountains nor dams were left, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I rose up with the banner of righteousness in Lamsung Mountain, led my life in wild and desert places. Each day I was obsessed by the thought of the enemy with whom I could not share the same sky. I took an oath not to live on the same earth with these rebellious bandits. Um, and he goes on for, for a, a number of pages. And so this is a document which is both the history of the revolt and a justification of it. Wing Tri also wrote a number of other important documents for Leloy. Um, Leloy also wanted to pass the day-to-day the -day administration over to his son. Uh, so Wing Tri wrote uh, the following. In every generation, the passing on of the imperial throne has been the same. For myself, I had to cut through thorny prickles and harrow among the fierce people. I had an armored helmet for a blanket and rice fields for a house. I rushed at danger and confronted inclement weather and sharp weapons. Only after all that could I sweep clean the country and successfully found our estate and institutions. How hard was such a creative task? Now you, who, who take advantage of my having successfully accom successful accomplishments and who inherit my, wor inherit my work, listen. In your work of governing the state and leading soldiers, you must keep your mind pure and follow the right principle with the greatest effort without a moment of idleness. With regard to your close relatives, keep concord and love firmly placed in your heart. Treat kindly the people as you would a child and always have in mind tolerance and humanity for politics. Do not let your gratitude for personal favors lead you to reward, nor let personal grudges lead you to punish. Do not collect money to waste on luxuries. Do not take pleasure in beautiful girls to become unrestrained in lust. As for employing people, you must not forget about your inner wishes. Suffer to listen and accept being dissuaded. Each order and each regulation promulgated, each word and mannerism given out, all must center in correct righteousness. All must be in accordance with the normal rules. Only in that manner can you rightly respond to heaven's heart above and sanctify the people's aspirations below. In this way, the nation will long be peaceful. Now, if you use only your own intelligence, if you listen to your private servants, or abandon my officials and change my pattern of rules, alter the established laws, banish from your sight your closest relatives, and remove yourself from those who are loyal and upright to associate with flattering toadies, if you do only those things which please your private pleasure, purchase only what pleases your eye, abandon the rule of thrift, and forget the hard labor which alone results in actual achievement, then it is, as the old story has it, the father laid the foundation and built the house, but the son did not build the reception halls. The father brought land into cultivation, but the son did not sow or harvest. How then can you expect to implement my will? How can you maintain my kingship and hope to have it inherited within the family over a long time? So here's Wing Chai for Leiloi writing to the crown prince sort of summing up, I think, part of this essence of vietnamese The throne depends on the character of the king and the prince. Just because he's born a prince doesn't mean it's going to go his way. He has to be a good person. He has to worry about his own duk, his own virtue. He has to think about phuc duk for, for the descendants. Uh, he has to bring about harmony. This is a little bit more Chinese. In Chinese would say tiang and, and min. In Vietnam, Vietnamese, you'd probably say chai duck. The, the heaven and the earth and the people, you have to bring them into alignment, you have to have harmony, and you have to achieve harmony, not impose it. 
Uh, and if you do this, then you will have a strong state and a strong people. And you can, be, you can beat the Chinese and the people will be happy under your rule. So I think I need to stop now. Um, didn't get a chance to read a lot of poems by Wing Tai. They're really great. Uh, I encourage all of you, um, if you can get The Heritage of Vietnamese Poetry by Win San Tom, uh, he's got a lot of these things translated in, into wonderful English. Uh, and you can get a sense of the spirit of this man, Wing Tai, about, about 1400, about 1434. Uh, and this kind of culminates, I think, the emergence of the Vietnamese people uh, as an independent people with an independent state with a, a philosophy of rule and law codes shaped around Buddhist teachings of compassion and individualism. And next week we'll talk about how things begin to change when more Neo-Confucianism comes in from China. So thank you very much.